afternoon and welcome back to another Harcom webinar. I'm Stefan Komonik, co-founder and managing partner at Harcom Time Series. Please note that all our live webinars will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel. You will receive a direct link along with a follow-up email right afterwards. There you can check out a lot of useful information all around time series. Last time we talked about that the new tech era has begun and the topic of today's webinar is another proof for that. I've been working in software development for 35 years now and I can't remember a technology trend that has conquered the globe so rapidly. With a bang everyone can instantly perceive the power of AI. The mega trends of our time, cloud computing and the rapid development of artificial intelligence have resulted in assistance that can do seemingly incredible things. Yes, we are talking about ChatGPT, which uses a method of AI called deep learning and even more specifically a neural network architecture known as Generative Pre-trained Transformer, which is what GPT stands for. Like always in our webinars, we want to provide practical information and we want to highlight the benefits and provide examples of how this technology can help developers hands-on. And as always, we're all about time series. Therefore today we'll talk about a specific time series use case, familiar to everyone who works with time series, how ChatGPT can be set up in a development environment in no time, and how it can help a developer to speed up coding, making use of the data it was trained with. We will discuss future aspects and expectations of that technology in terms of functions and features to come. And finally, we will ask the question, as professional developers, are we allowed to use the results without any further thoughts about intellectual property? Does the code and all IP rights really belong to us? With us is Maximilian Absenger, project manager at Hacom Time Series. He will show the use case extending our standard time series service with individual functionalities using ChatGPT in no time. Together with Thomas Hasleder, co-founder and CTO of Hacom Time Series, the two of them will talk about the challenges and the expectations for this incredibly fast developing technology. Let me also introduce Jeanette Gozera, Attorney at Law and Vice President of the European AI Forum. She will specifically address the legal aspects that need to be considered and give an outlook on different regulatory scenarios that may come our way in this area. So, come on, let's start and meet the panelists. Hello everybody and welcome to our next HACOM webinar. A warm welcome from our speakers, Jeanette. Hi, Jeanette. Hello. Max and Thomas, all of us here live Hello. from Vienna. And I greet more than 250 who joined us up to now. So thanks very much. And a special thanks goes out to my wonderful team, Anja, Christiana, Ingmar, Vera. You make this all possible. You create so much noise and visibility. So thanks to you especially. Once more, I kindly ask all of you to get in touch with us during the webinar. Please use the Q&A function because at the end we will, as always, have our Q&A session. Please challenge us. And as usual, we want to answer all of your questions. So when Thomas some months ago proposed to do a webinar about how ChatGPT can help a developer, I must admit that I didn't know how to sort that out. How on earth can I, as a developer, have ChatGPT create some code for me and how does it work? And that was exactly what I was asked so many times now during the last weeks. So I feel even more reassured that this is the perfect topic for our webinar format. And here we are. So, to answer that question, we want to start with a typical time series based use case. What we see here is some, something that every developer and a user of a time series based solution knows only too well. You get data in a certain format from a specific source and typically the for format is um, somewhat useful but it needs to be converted in order to ingest it into a database. For doing that we provide as you can see a REST API and that API needs data in a certain format. So first step is to convert it. But that alone most probably will not be sufficient. We all know that data comes with errors, with gaps, outliers or implausible values. So the next step typically is to validate it before actually ingesting it. And it's a question of design if you want to store the original data or not. In our simple use case we will do all this in just one step. And looking at it, this represents a typical use case of creating a customized app using standard software packages. 
Max works with us as a project manager, and he helps our clients to use our API in the best possible way. So we chose to start from scratch, and Max will basically have a white screen and needs to create the environment first. So by following his steps, you could do all of that yourself afterwards. So let's now have a look together at how this can be massively accelerated by using ChatGPT. Yeah, please start our video. Hi guys, it's Max from Arkham Time Series, and today we'll look at how you, as a developer, can use ChatGPT. Um, by now, all of you probably know ChatGPT. Today I want to use it to support me creating Python code. Um, working with a Jupyter Notebook as I can perfectly combine it with our time series technology. So my first question to ChatGPT is how can I easily or quickly set up a Jupyter Notebook? And it says install Python, install Jupyter, run Jupyter. So let's do that. I've already installed the software. Time to run Jupyter. I am now in Jupyter and about to start a Python notebook. My task today is to import time series from a CSV file that contains measurements of the outdoor temperature in European cities. As you can see, we have some timestamps in an hourly grid and the respective values. To import this data into my database, I need to put it into a structured form, which usually is a tedious task. That's why I want to outsource this part to ChatGPT. I can communicate with ChatGPT using my Jupyter Notebook using ChatGPT's API. There are some tutorials available explaining how to do that. First of all, I need to pass my credentials. Then I pass this function here, which lets me communicate with the ChatGPT API. As you can see, there is a user property in which I formulate my request. Write code for parsing the file temperature SCV and importing the data in a data frame. The data has the following format and so on. The file temperature SCV is located in the Jupyter installation path. As you can see, ChatGPT generated some code for me. Read the CSV file, rename the columns, convert the data, set the date, column as index, print. All right, let's see how that works. Okay, that looks good. So technically I could import the data like this via the Hakum Time Series API, but as you can see, there seem to be some unplausible values in here. I am pretty sure that it wasn't 50 degrees Celsius in Vienna in January. That is why I want ChatGPT to generate code for a plausibility test. So I've updated the message like this. The data in the CSV file are hourly temperatures in Europe. Write code for validating the temperature in the data frame returned by the CSV file import. Replace invalid temperatures with a data frame with an empty value. ChatGPT now added code that checks whether the values lie between negative 50 and 50 degrees. Let's see if that works. That worked pretty good. As you can see, the 51 was replaced by not a number value, but I'm still not satisfied. You can see here that there are huge differences from one hour to the other. That's why I want ChatGPT to write code that also checks the differences in temperature from one hour to another. Check not only for a plausible temperature range, but also check if the temperature differences from one hour to the next is plausible. As you can see, ChatGPT generated code to check if there is an absolute deviation of 20 degrees to the previous hour. Before I run this code, I have to import the dataset again, as there are now not a number of values in the current one, which would throw errors when they are compared to integers like this. And look at that. In a matter of minutes, ChatGPT helped me generate code that structures my data and also checks for plausibility, so I can import it into my database. And I think that's pretty awesome. Now, that was a very basic example, but I think now you can easily imagine that you can implement more complex individual scenarios. Now back to you, Stefan. Thanks, Max. I just read uh, from one of the spectators that the, the readability, uh, readability was low. We're sorry for that, but if you can look at the recordings, then you'll see it the right way, I hope. 
So, Max, in the video you showed us how to create this custom code uh, for this typical use case uh, using ChatGPT. From your experience, if you compare this, doing that without ChatGPT, how does that help you? Uh, thank you, Stefan. First of all, I need to say that I'm not a developer, but give support to developers who use our technology for specific use cases. So in my daily routine, I deal with developers and use case owners trying to figure out how our technology can be used in the best possible way. Creating code is usually something that I do only from time to time. So very often I need to remember how I created code for a use case that was somehow like the one that's on the table right now um, to create a useful implementation example. But as you've seen, I could create a piece of code in no time for a specific format conversion. And that's great. So I get support creating code the right way much faster without having to ask somebody who is an expert in that specific field. Uh, neither do I have to scan our internal code base for a piece of code that fits that particular use case. And secondly, when we talk about use cases, we need some specific knowledge in a certain customer's domain based on data that is available somewhere. In our example, that was temperature that would be typically measured in European cities. Using ChatGPT, we got some useful information based on data that is available somewhere and create code that is based, uh, based on this data in no time. And that's a huge relief because this way I can focus on the use case rather than on coding and can create an implementation example really fast. So basically it's like having a developer assistant who has access to all information, uh, data and programming skills. Sounds reasonable, Max, thank you. Uh, now um, we heard about some practical uh, aspects. How about strategic, strategic aspects? Uh, Thomas, uh, as our CTO, what does that mean in terms of strategy? What's the use for a software company or a team that needs to create a custom code? As you have seen, ChatGPT not only generates code, but it also provides comments explaining the code and general information about what functionality it has implemented. In my opinion, the most striking fact is that ChatGPT shows deep understanding of the problem. On the one hand, through self-chosen strategies, like the temperature range, um, and on the other hand, also through the comments that describe the solution parts in detail. Fascinatingly, ChatGPT can even respond interactively to change requests regarding the solution paths. Max already mentioned that the whole process gets much faster but what we can see already now is that most probably the code quality will increase massively. Mm -hmm. And of course, saving of code, this is reducing the cost of coding, is always an issue in times of shortage of skilled professionals. A major cost driver in software projects is usually the time spent on the custom development part. If artificial intelligence is used, this time can be massively reduced. But now let us look at the prerequisites. To make the best use of the new abilities, it is essential to create a perfect framework. If the framework fits, then with the support of AI, you will be able to generate great code incredibly fast. However, AI will not generate anything uh, itself from scratch. This includes the environment, like operating system, uh, programming language, standard tools, used such as uh, graphic components, scalable databases and computation services, and many more. Our time series technology is part of this and fits perfectly in this environment. Very cool, Thomas. Uh, makes sense. Uh, so technologies like ours can even multiply the benefits of such models. And um, what do you think about future, Thomas, about future aspects? OK, let's think about the future using the example of converting a format of input data and then storing the data into the database using our API. Microsoft has already announced that large language models will soon be available trained with enterprise data to learn specific technologies. So we can then train the model on our time series API. For the use case shown, this means that you can have code generated that not only does the conversion, but also saves it right away using the right functions of our API. In the middle of this, we can have suitable validation all in one. This is another huge step to map individual requirements in a very short time. We can then even make this functionality available for time series developer in our own chatbot, for example. 
How does that sound, Stefan? <laughs> well, so that, that actually means that not only parts of the custom coding can be covered, uh, as we see here, um, like this one, but that the ingestion of data using our specific API can be done as well. So actually the whole range, um, so all in all, that sounds as if almost anything will be doable. Um, but so far, we've only looked at the technical perspective. That's what is technically possible. And we can use these new technologies perfectly, as you can see. But now I'll have to ask Jeanette from the legal perspective, and actually there was a question coming in uh, regarding this, are we allowed to use the results, that is the generated code, without any restrictions? Thank you very much, Stefan, for this question. Um, so, um, you know, the legal answer is it always depends. And I would like to give you an idea of kind of like the things you need to consider when working with code generated by ChatGPT. And uh, which is most practical is to look at your input dimension, to look at the tool you're using, and then to look at also the output dimension. And uh, we already thought about some input data. In your case, it's weather data, it's geodata, and so forth and so on. So non-personal data. In this case, um, you need to check if you're kind of like allowed to use that data for your commercial purposes, for whatever purpose you're planning to work with it. Um, beside that, you of course also have the personal data, which is subject to the GDPR constraints. In addition, also kind of like to any agreements you might have with people for the purposes, those data that might be processed. Also, you need to look at a copyrighted material. So if you have some copyrighted material you're feeding into those generative tools, there also might be some restrictions there. And it's read in the slide because this is a very important factor. You also need to consider your business secrets, of course, because um, if you feed the secret into one of those tools, um, it might be highly likely um, that your business secret is then out in the open, which happened to um, a major company and is very, very unfortunate. So these are things to consider before you put the data into the tool. So are you allowed to use the data for that process? And do you need to worry about specific restrictions, for example, personal data, for example, copyrights, or for, like, for example, business secrets? Then I put ChatGPT here because this is the tool we're discussing in particular, but it applies to every other generative tool you might be working. You should look at their uh, terms and conditions, what you might use from the output. And I looked at the ChatGPT terms and select I would like to point out here. Um, for example, ChatGPT in their current version, which does not say this will not change in the future, permits you to use the output to the extent legally permitted. So um, this is also a reference um, back to you, to your home jurisdiction. You might need to look at uh, specific aspects there. But of course, they also permit uh, commercial purposes, which I think is a very important factor for uh, coders, developers, enterprises using ChatGPT in their business context. And another thing to remember uh, in their terms, they say kind of like you may you must disclose th that the output was not or is not human generated. So uh, no imposter syndrome. You may not say this is your code. So you need to kind of like reflect somehow that this code is not your code or not generated by you. Um, and the last thing I would like to point out, which we also heard um, before, it's human checks and verifying because of course there is no guarantee the code will work the code will not have negative impacts um, for example on your software your system your customer software and systems so there are still um, a few aspects to consider here and I would like to proceed to a few recommendations I gathered to give you also um, some practical guidance and some idea um, for some tools also for chat GPT it's possible to use them in the browser version, so you know the free version, you know the pro version, but there's also an API version. Uh, why is this important? Because if in particular looking at ChatGPT, this determines um, for what purposes the input is used. So kind of like all the data you put into ChatGPT, um, with the API version, for example, they say the content will not be used for further developing their services, which is fully different uh, for the other browser versions where you need to the object and fill out another form, go through some admin, 
Um, otherwise, the content is definitely used in the background for them to refine their model, to train their model, and so on and so forth. So this is one important aspect uh, to keep in mind. Another thing is liability protection, because even if you're allowed to use your input data, you check the tools and you're allowed to use the output data, um, nothing guarantees, of course, that um, ChatGPT or in the training of those models, um, there was no copyright infringement, there was no infringement of third party rights. So what you want to take care and be sure of is that if there is a third party claim, you protect yourself from liability because you're relying on such tools. IP protection, this is something I mentioned before. So <clears throat> take care of your business secrets. Um, and really kind of like be mindful which data you use and which input you give to those tools because that uh, your sensitive information or your business secrets um, just won't evaporate, get out um, and then be gone forever. And then, of course, uh, control and human in the loop. Always verify the code before you, for example, sell it to a customer, include it into your own systems, just to be on the safe side, because, of course, there's no guarantee um, ChatGPT is 100% right or the output is 100% perfect. So these just a few aspects uh, to keep in mind when using those tools. And now I think it's time, Stefan, to already proceed to a call to action, right? We saw that it is surprisingly easy to create customized code using ChatGPT and profit from all the information that AI has access to. Therefore, together, let us unleash the potential of ChatGPT with our time series technology for your specific use case. To make this as straightforward as possible, we have created an efficient process to work out a clear proof of value. Together with your experts, we will create code on the fly using the PowerTSM service and OpenAI for your specific requirements. Within a few hours, we will show you hands-on how to work on your use case with ChatGPT, making our proof of value program even more efficient. Contact us at tsmlab at hacom.at to get more information. And if you're looking for legal help regarding AI, Jeanette is your first point of contact. If it's about any legal issue related to AI, from AI strategy to legal implementation, benefit from her experience working with startups, scale-ups and major organizations whose business models are driven by AI. She's very much looking forward to hearing from you. And now let's start answering some questions. And as always, back to you, Stefan. So thanks to my digital twin once more. Um, I have a special announcement uh, for all those who decide very quickly to join our program uh, by the end of next week. Actually, we are offering it a special at the special price of only 990 euros. So please go for it. But um, now let's start uh, with uh, our Q&A. Um, I've seen several questions coming in and uh, one was Actually, is it legal when you use ChatGPT in your code without customer consent? What about providing data of customer to ChatGPT? Um, Janet, I think the first one you have answered, but what would happen if I, I um, present a customer's data to ChatGPT? Uh, am I um, allowed to do this? Um, that is something that you need to check, uh, first of all, in your customer agreement and in your data protection declaration, because there you inform customers, for example, uh, for what purposes you use their data. And there is always this bond between data, data consent and purpose. So this is something you need to check there. And also, if you work with customers' data on a commercial basis, um, or do data sharing, for example, or other kind of like joint um, data development with customers, you should specify in your agreement who is allowed to use the data for what purposes. And if you use the data without customer's consent or for purposes the customer has not consented, I would say that's a very bad idea because you're probably then in the fields of breach of con tech, uh, contract when it's not non-personal data. And if it's personal data, probably you have a GDPR problem. So, so that's something I would clarify right in the beginning before putting the data into ChatGPT. Also, something I want you to be mindful is 
I would not put personal customer data into ChatGPT. So kind of like name, date of birth, address, passport numbers. So that's something I would really refrain from. The same goes for, you know, sensitive information like medical data you might have, um, I don't know, data relating to financial transactions. So um, that's something I would really try to keep out of ChatGPT. Thanks, Jeanette. Um, another question, uh, which chat GPT model uh, are you using? Uh, and any information about cost of it, um, Thomas? What would yes, you? Yes, uh, um, we used for the, for the API, the 3.5 Turbo model. That's, uh, that's the only, or uh, the newest that's available for that. And, uh, and the costs uh, are in, um, in the cents per tokens. So it's, uh, uh, 0 0.15 cents uh, to 3 uh, cents per thousand tokens uh, for the input and 2 to 4 uh, 0 0.20 to 0 0.4 per thousand tokens uh, per output. So that's that's the pricing model. So you pay for, for the amount of uh, uh, data you send in and the data you get out uh, of the model. And it, it's it's quite reasonable, the, the price, I think. Uh, it depends on what you are doing with this. Uh, and uh, at the moment, for the for the API, only the 3.5 Turbo model is is available. But uh, for the um, 4.0 model, the prices would be much much higher. So at, at the moment, they charge uh, three cents per thousand tokens for the GTP4 model. Uh, if you use this uh, in in some other context. Okay, thank you. Another interesting one, technical-wise, is ChatGPT able to trim down code where applicable? Also, is it able to optimize code based uh, on SLAs like speed and throughput of data if you specify those limit par params? I don't know if we know about that. I, I could only guess. Um, Thomas, Max, any comments? Um, I would say that I heard it is possible to um, trim down code, but I am not sure about optimizing, and as uh, you should definitely uh, let a human control <laughs> this optimization. I would say uh, it's it's uh, astoundingly how much uh, uh, the, the model is available or is capable of uh, optimizing itself. Uh, if you ask for that, uh, especially for this parameter, I think it, it would be very easy. But uh, often it it just uh, you get a better output if you ask the model just to rethink uh, the solution it provides. Uh, if it uh, can can do it a little bit better, then you sometimes even get better uh, output. So that's that's very interesting just to try out to uh, to get your output and then to review it and ask the model for uh, improving it regarding some uh, some KPIs or, or whatever you want want to change. So. It's it's not easy to to answer this uh, this question in general, but it's it's quite impressive. Uh, Promising trying it, I would say. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, how about that? Is ChatGPT's knowledge and database still limited to 2021? Jeanette, do you know that maybe? Because there was this. I, limit? Or I Max? know that. <laughs> I know that it <laughs> just it, it told me today. I asked it a question, and it told me today that its knowledge is still limited to September, I think, twenty one. Ah, okay, okay, thank you. Yes, um, the training period ended uh, in, in twenty one, and uh, they they do not plan to uh, to extend this period in, in the near future. Um, but possibly you could use uh, the plugin functions of ChatGPT. And then ChatGPT is uh, is able to to browse the internet for newer uh, information. So with with the uh, browser plugin, you can ask for the the newest developments in politics or whatever, and then you will get the right answer. Good, thank you. Um, one question I can answer very fast. I using ChatGPT API on a Jupyter notebook. It was not. Uh, I was not able to read the code from the screen. The answer is yes. Um, and uh, then there's another one. Uh, many thanks for this credit. Could you repeat the distinction of legal implications on API versus non-API? Uh, API, there's no reuse of model, but non-API, there's reuse, correct? Um, Janet, could you? Yes, of mm -hmm. course. Um, so let's just sort this out. Exactly. So if you use the API, um, at least at the current state, uh, OpenAI specifies in their general terms that they are not using the content, so your input and your output, to further refine their services. 
And that is not true for non-API use, because when you use not the API, they use everything you put in and everything you put out and also your feedback and so on and so forth to further develop um, OpenAI services and ChatGPT. And I saw, I checked yesterday, there is a form um, for the uh, non-API use where you may object to the certain use of your data, but you need to look into that into a little bit more detail. But that's the current status. So um, also this is something you should monitor because things change so, so rapidly. And of course, also uh, the current terms may change from OpenAI. Thanks, Janet. Um, can I use ChatGPT for solar generation and energy demand forecasting? Is there any option in ChatGPT for my data protection? Okay, first one. I didn't try that. Um, Thomas, have you tried maybe um, creating a forecast? No, I didn't. I think it, it wouldn't be a, a good fit to, to use the large language model for forecasting purposes. But even with this, um, if, if there are any uh, plugins available, so there's, uh, for example, the, the Wolfram plugin for calculations available, then this would work out fine in, in combination with the chat GPT and, and the plugins, but only the large language model, uh, I think is not, uh, is not the, the right, uh, instrument for, for doing forecasts. I think minimum requirement would be to pass also the predictors for as let's say next day or next two days. So I would have to input next day's weather forecast somehow because this is very actual. And without that, I think it doesn't make too much sense to ask this, the, the model for anything. Yes, and, and it is, is not even very good in, in doing some calculations. As there are some examples out there were just quite easy uh, text samples are not answered correctly. So I think it, it wouldn't be a good idea just to, to show many numbers in and hope that they're coming uh, correct numbers out again. Um, I think that's that's not the, the right task for uh, ChatGPT. Okay, thank you. Um, another interesting legal question. Can companies ban ChatGPT usage in company networks in terms of work contract? Jeanette, what do you think? Um, so kind of like I've already seen this in the news for huge US corporations. So I don't know if it's still true now, but uh, for example, JP Morgan banned the use of uh, chat GPT in their operations and also other huge corporates. Um, uh, so if you're an employee of a corporate company, um, I think it's their right to kind of like specify which working tools shall be used or shall be not used so and they of course have the technical ability if you work on their kind of like computer system so they could just uh, not allow you access to it and what i think is the better approach is because people just take out the cell phone or they take, take out their tablet or private notebook and do it anyway so um, what i think is the better approach actually is to guide employees because uh, you need to How help yeah, Sorry. you need to guide them and to help them how to use it and tell them not to put in the client data, not to put in certain things and just onboard them on this development, uh, which I think is more risk minimizing than just banning the use of ChatGPT in, in a company. Um, but from an employment law perspective, I think it's possible, yes. Okay, thank you, Jeanette. So back again um, for next questions. Um, we're still here for you. I read an interesting one. Uh, Microsoft recently proposes instantiations of some open API models via Azure services. Uh, so they provide them, obviously. How about the recommendations about data privacy and secrets filled to those models hosted by Azure open AI services? Hmm. Good question. So I think it's an important question, but it's something that I did not check. So something I would recommend is really checking their terms mm -hmm. to see um, what they specify about input, what they specify about output use. And also, of course, you know, the GDPR standards apply anyway the same. And um, the thing about the business secrets is always also the same issue because the nature of the business secret is that it's a secret. Once you put it out there, um, you may lose protection, which can be very damaging. So uh, those are the two aspects to keep in mind. And apart from that, I would just uh, check their terms. I think uh, you will find a lot of information in there, even if it's burdensome reading them. So I'm also not a fan, but sometimes it's necessary. Thanks, Jeanette. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> and the technical one, Neil, um, uh, asked it, have you compared ChatGPT with GitHub Copilot? I'm not quite sure about that. Um, Thomas, did we try that? Uh, yes, I also tried out the uh, GitHub Copilot, but I did not do any direct uh, uh, comparison. So GitHub Pilot is more of uh, an integrated tool for the developer in the, in the Visual Studio, for example. So um, it's more assisting the, the de developer in his developing process. And what we wanted to show is, is how to use it for for some guys that they are not their daily business uh, developing functions. So I think it's the difference is, is more in, in the uh, in the users, uh, what, what they want to do with it more than than in the functionality. But I, I did not do any direct uh, um, comparison. OK, thanks, Thomas. Another technical question. Um, um, most times series I use are in CSV or uh, Excel format. Have, have you used ChatGPT also to work in Excel with time series? Did we do that? Um, no, as ChatGPT doesn't have any direct access to any uh, any files. You, uh, um, as we have shown, would have to create code. That code then uh, then uses the data. So we could ask, uh, as we did before, uh, ChatGPT to generate. Uh, code that works in an uh, Excel workbook and then then operates on the data in the Excel workbook. I think this this would work the same as it does with uh, CSV files, but we did not try out this. So uh, I also have seen some demonstration where ChatGPT generated some uh, VBA code to generate a presentation. So I think this would work out with Excel as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, another legal question. Uh, we heard it's uh, required to disclose that non-human generated code was used. Is there a formal requirement on how this disclosure has to look like? Jeanette, what would you say? Uh, well, formal requirements. So currently the entire generative AI foundation model space is still in a regulatory vacuum, I would say. Um, but still, since OpenAI requests this in their terms currently, um, what you could do is put it in your general terms that you say, okay, you use certain parts um, that are generated by this tool and so on and so forth. Also connect this um, with uh, deflecting liability. That's how I would put it. And also this is something I would really clearly address because there's another aspect uh, you need to keep in mind. Um, if you generate code with a chat GPT, of course, they give you the usage rights as far as permitted by law, also for commercial purposes. But um, you would need to do a follow up questions um, if, if, if it's kind of like not important to have proprietary uh, rights to this code. Mm, it, it's not so bad, but if you want to kind of like integrate that code into other codes or systems or programs that you want to have proprietary ownership of, mm -hmm. uh, you need to think about the question who owns legally really the code that comes out of ChatGPT. And this is currently a question that is in moving. And what most legal professionals say, and what I also support is that the code is generated by a software basically. And the software uh, cannot own rights. So the code um, does not have an author, right? So it might belong to everybody or nobody, but you are definitely not in the position to be the sole owner of that code. So if you start mixing those codes with your proprietary code that you developed in-house, which, which is of course attributed to you, which you have sole rights to, that might cause a problem. So um, also I would keep that clearly in mind and always think about it twice when I try to integrate that code in my own proprietary code, because that could be some conflict uh, with ownership rights um, and create some, some ubiquities there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Jeanette, thanks. Thanks for this detailed answer, but I think we should give room to that because it's really important. Um, uh, interesting question. How can we use ChatGPT for energy theft detection using smart meter data or customer energy consumption data? Uh, I know uh, of projects um, when you use forecasts um, um, to, for doing that. So again, I think that leads back to the, the answer of Thomas that um, it's hard to use ChatGPT, at least right now, to um, calculate um, basically something. Uh, Thomas, do you agree or have I? Yes, you have to keep in mind 
Uh, this is a, a large language model, and, and as, as the name says, uh, its purpose is to, to put out some, some text, it can be some advice, some information about something, or even code, uh, as code uh, is, uh, is nothing else than some kind of text. Uh, but it doesn't have any built-in functionality for uh, functionality for calculation or, or anything else beyond uh, uh, creating text. So you can uh, ask ChatGPT for, for hints how to detect this and how to do it. Uh, and you can uh, ask it for code to implement this hints it gives to you, but it cannot do it uh, on its own. So you have to do it with the, the input. Uh, is it hints or code that you get from ChatGPT? Okay, thank you. Another good question of Radoslav. Can we find from what data source are data obtained as a part of ChatGPT response? I often wanted that too. Is there a way? <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. So uh, as, as uh, OpenAI does not disclose what data they have used to train their model. And, uh, and it's, it's not uh, in, in the model uh, th that it answers or gives hints about where it gets the, the information. You can ask for that, but typically you do not get a very useful answer about the, the resource uh, that has been used for the, for the answer. Okay, and then another question um, about ChatGPT models itself. Is that a good practice to fill time series directly to this model and demand it to evaluate the time series? How about handle the volume of data in this case? I'm not quite sure if I uh, really it's, fully I think it, it's, uh, it's a question in the same direction we answered already. Uh, it could be just not only words in, but, but only the, uh, the data. So the answer is clearly no, uh, just to, to fill in the, the data in the ChatGPT model and to expect some useful output, whatever you want ChatGPT to do with this data, this would not work out well. A simple question, can you share this recording? We will, <laughs> we will share it with all of you and send out a direct link uh, right afterwards. Um, and the last question, uh, how about sustainability of, of this uh, technology? Um, I would like to answer this, uh, but only for, for coding. Um, so, uh, because I, I recently read an interesting um, article about uh, the, the energy consumption of, of, of different program languages for the same exercise. And if C code needs one kilowatt hours, um, uh, codes like Python will use 75 times as much. So it might be better to ask ChatGPT for creating a C code next time. <laughs> and and, um, and that, that would make the code more sustainable in that sense. Um, any com other comments maybe um, regarding sustainability and maybe energy consumption of ChatGPT itself? I, I, don't, I don't have any more information on that. Um, I don't have detailed information. I uh, asked ChatGPT about this. <laughs> Uh, uh, the answer was not uh, not very clear. <laughs> I think the, the most uh, uh, energy um, consumption part is the training part, and, and that's uh, done upfront uh, to answer one one prompt uh, or, or ask for one prompt is like uh, getting a uh, Google uh, answer. I think there's there's no no big difference in asking ChatGPT or or the Google for something. Okay, okay. thank you. Um, now, simple question is, I don't have to ask ChatGPT um, how late it is <laughs> and we are how over time is, is, is over now. It's uh, quarter to three already. Uh, thanks to all of you staying with us. It's a three digit number. <laughs> so thank you very much. Um, but we have to finish now. Uh, thanks for staying with us. See you soon. Stay tuned. And please, all of you, don't forget that life is a time series. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.